Uh, welcome. I am Sean Roberts, Chief Technologist for Lincoln Network, and this is Lincoln Shorts. I have with me Charles Duan, Senior Fellow for Technology and Innovation Policy at R Street. Welcome, Charles. Hey, thanks, Sean, for having me on this. Of course. So um, we were just talking about, and we we're preparing for this a little bit about um, different problems that exist with big tech. Um, certainly, there's a lot of discussion in the public space and, and uh, government and certainly on social media about solutions for um, improving things. Um, a lot of them are pretty heavy handed. Um, we'd yeah. like to propose based on uh, some of the problems that we've seen some possible less heavy handed solutions that would be hopefully maybe even build some new businesses and, uh, and uh, drive more uh, business innovation rather than less. So uh, one of them we were talking about is content moderation that right now Facebook decides what you, what you see and don't see. Um, and it's somewhat of a mystery meet. We have to just uh, assume uh, based on uh, the benevolence of Facebook that they're doing right by us and they're delivering what we really wanna see and not making some judgment call. Um, there's probably a lot of people that disagree right at, as soon as I make that statement. So um, what, uh, could you tell me a little bit more? I kind of touched on what I think the problem is. Can you tell me a little bit more about how you, uh, how you to define the problem? Yeah, yeah, you know, I think content moderation is one of the most difficult problems that all policymakers are facing today. Um, just given the proliferation of content on social media, um, on the internet, um, it's a it's a long-standing problem. Um, it, it was one that was recognized in the very early days of the internet that you could have undesirable content, um, mostly pornography, is what they were concerned about at the time, and that platforms ought to have ways to be able to try to deal with them, either by taking them down or by flagging them, um, or by by other means um, to to deal with different you know different people's interests and tastes in what they what they want to see. Um, as the as the internet has become more concentrated onto a number of big platforms, though, I think what people have realized is that gives those platforms a lot of power over what the general public sees and how they understand information. Um, and this has led to all sorts of controversy. So, for example, you have matters of um, public officials, such as the president, being flagged for false information. Mm. Um, that's you know has, has generated no small amount of controversy. Then you have um, you, know, you know, Facebook taking down certain information as fake news, and then how you determine what's fake news. That's up to Facebook. Um, Facebook has spent a lot of time trying to come up with different procedures, such as creating this new, um, this new independent review board to try to to try to make those um, those decisions more legitimate. Um, but ultimately, what it comes down to is that we have a world in which there are a relatively small number of platforms. Um, obviously, any number of them can start up right now, but you know most people tend to use um, self one or, one or more of the dominant ones. And those platforms are the ones who choose all in, at the end of the day, what the policy for content moderation is. Not surprisingly, there will always be people who are unhappy about that. And the question is, is there a better approach than just sort of asking the platforms to make everybody happy, which obviously hasn't worked for the last, um, for the last couple of years at least. So basically the, the problem, putting the, putting the solution into the customer's hands, so to speak, the user's hands, and, and taking the decision-making process of what you get to see and not see, somewhat uh, cutting the, the back end, which uh, probably would be uh, uh, Facebook at this point, um, at least allowing you to cut the back end out, or excuse me, uh, cutting the, allowing them to be the back end and then uh, uh, putting the front end control back into the user's hands. They could use either Facebook's front end or somebody else's. Yeah, and so you know the idea is if you if you don't want to give if you, if you don't want to say that um, these these individual companies are the ones who have to make all the decisions and are ultimately going to make nobody happy, the better approach would just be to have the users who are seeing the content decide what content they want to see. Right. And the reason we do that right now is that Facebook is a single unified whole. They control both the front end, the web pages that display information, and the back end, the stores of the information. What if you could disaggregate those two and you could have different companies who make different front ends and different back ends? And that way, if you know you decide that you prefer contents um, in a certain direction, or you prefer to see more, or you prefer to see less, or you prefer to see you know less pornography, or you know, any number of things, you just find a separate front end. 
It turns out that we actually have a very good system that does this already, um, and that's email. If you look at the way that email works, you have all of these backend servers from which you receive email, and then you have your own um, your, your email client, be that Apple Mail or Gmail or Microsoft Outlook, which contains spam filters and contains other sorts of content moderation tools, essentially. Mm. That what you want to see and how you want to filter it. Right. It's that separation of the back end from the front end that you know that allows people to have that choice. But the only way you have that separation between the back end and the front end is if there's a way for the back end and the front end to talk to talk to each other in some sort of way that they can predict you know what's going to happen. That's ultimately what interoperability is all about. And that's kind of you know what we're what we're planning on talking about in the in the paper that we're working on right now. Mm -hmm. um, you have to have that sort of glue between the pieces of the ecosystem, this, this, you know, theoretical, this back end of data and this front end that displays what you want to see in order for people to have that sort of choice. The reason that you don't have that sort of choice on Facebook right now is that Facebook forces you to have both of these things together. They don't allow other people to display Facebook data in that same sort of way. So in order to have that sort of disaggregation function that I think will really be helpful if we want to try to address this content moderation problem, you have to allow that sort of disaggregation between parts of the, um, between parts of the social media ecosystem and interoperability by providing the glue that connects those parts seems like a really essential part to getting that to happen. So mail, email is moved around by this protocol uh, called SMTP. And probably not a ton of people are familiar with it. But that literally is how email flows around. And, they, and there's an expectation that it's somewhat of a finite amount of payload that, you know, the, the stuff that we actually want to see that's in there. And there is some support nowadays of HTML and um, uh, attachments. And so it has evolved somewhat over the years. It's been around for about 20 years-ish. Um, so what, what do you think would be a similar type of practical implementation to emulate that SMTP protocol that had made interoperability and email possible, there's there's obviously a little bit more complicated. There's some more back end stuff that, but that's really the, the I think the crux. What do you think is the equi roughly equivalent here with Facebook? Yeah, I mean, ultimately, you know, you look at you look at email, and it's it's simultaneously very simple and very complicated. All that it is, is a way for one computer to say, hey, so say to another computer, hey, I've got a message, you should, you should pick it up. Um, and they're just standard terms that the computers will use to exchange the messages so that you know, one of them knows that they've gotten the right message and they know who it should be sent to and whether or not it needs to go somewhere else. Um, underneath that, though, there's all sorts of complexity about how you, you know, how you deal with HTML messages, how you um, prove that a message isn't spam. You know, there, there are all sorts of these, um, these different like, languages and protocols that underlie the email system. It ends up being very complicated. I think what will end up happening is if you wanted to try and port that concept over Facebook, you would run into the same problem. At base, it's a very simple concept. It's that Facebook stores data you want to be able to see it in different ways. And so, you know, your, your, your Facebook browser, I guess we might call it, um, sends requests to Facebook and says, hey, give me like my list of friends or give me the most recent posts. And then the front end will figure out how to display it. Underneath that, there almost certainly will be a ton of complexity. How exactly do you, you know, do you authenticate information? How do you make sure that you're not, you're not like DOSing the Facebook servers? Um, any number of problems. So one of the important things that we've learned in developing interoperability in lots of other contexts is that you don't want to just rely on like the government to come up with a standard for these sorts of things, or just hope that Facebook comes up with the best standard. Um, you generally want to have consortia of people, um, technical experts who you know, really know how this technology works and understand all of the ins and outs. And they put this thing together, usually incrementally. Um, that that's been the model that's worked for a lot of other tech for a lot of other technologies, including email. Um, email being yes. developed um, Internet Engineering Task Force, which is just you know a bunch of volunteers who are experts in coming up with these protocols. Um, I think that you would have to have some sort of similar process. Um, and one of the goals when it, when it comes to trying to increase interoperability in the web ecosystem is not saying what the standards are, but saying how we should come to them. How do we come up with these sorts of processes that develop them? How do we make sure those processes are fair? They're not stacked in favor of the companies who you know, probably don't really want that sort of um, that sort of thing to happen to their company. 
Um, those are those those are difficult questions, um, but we do actually have some pretty good ways of solving them that, that we've used in the past, and I think they would be equally applicable to um, to, to trying to address some of the social media problems we face today. So uh, probably a standards body, something like an IETF um, uh, or organization that's a nonprofit and anybody can join and contribute to. Um, something like what's uh, developed other technologies and protocols in the past, but also possibly addition, something like a WC3, which uh, has helped develop and maintain uh, web standards over the years. So um, those have loosely evolved without direct, direct government involvement. Do you think in this is one of the cases that perhaps uh, there needs to be some FTC or FCC type uh, involvement, it, it, that maybe at least lightly, to ensure that um, the standards that would be uh, uh, developed and maintained by uh, such organizations would be followed by some kind of hammer. <laughs> it's a great question. Um, I think you know there there was a previous effort um, some years ago. I think it was Google's Open Graph protocol to essentially develop a sort of uh, a, a social media um, inter data interchange standard. Mm -hmm. um, it never really took off. I think that was largely because um, you know Google's Google's equivalent social media service never really took off either, um, and so it didn't kind of have that sort of platform backing. The, the, the issue is that most of the standards that we look at, that, that we see on the internet, they were developed before there was any you know, big company that was kind of running the show. Um, the web standards, the, the email standards, all of these sorts of things. Um, it's, it's certainly going to be harder to convince a single company to open themselves up to, um, to essentially to competitors that you know, take away from you know, at least some parts of that some parts of the social media market share um, from what by, by introducing the sort of interoperability. At the same time, companies actually see a lot of benefits out of interoperability, um, especially when they open up APIs that allow for you know, third-party apps to show up on their platforms or for people to come up with unexpected, um, unexpected uses of their platforms that you know, might, might bring more value than people expected originally. Um, and so, you know, I think that probably you would need some sort of incentive, but it likely is much less than you would expect. I don't think you would have to go to the level of, you know, some sort of strict, some sort of strict mandate or regulation. There are a lot of incentives that push in both directions when it comes to interoperability. And I think that for those of us who want to see a, a more competitive, more interoperable internet, um, we just have to take advantage of the incentives that already exist and try to um, try try to foster and encourage them. Yeah. So maybe a way of closing out this discussion is that there's this um, uh, there's multiple efforts and, and probably some that we're not even aware of going on in Cong federal Congress right now. I'm sure there's some on the state level as well um, about um, the at least the the idea that. Um, certain technology companies are too dominant in their space. Um, there's certainly the, uh, you know, the Apple Fortnite um, app store debate that's r still raging. Um, it has you know, a lot of people on, on all 23 sides of the issue. Um, and there, there's a thought that, you know, somebody has to do something. Um, right now, that, that hammer that um, is available is antitrust. And uh, for uh, mergers, there's consent decrees. So um, do you think if we can come up as a you know, policy, tech policy and, um, and uh, engineering, if we can get our act together and come up with some concrete ideas that we could at least stave off the threat of, of uh, antitrust legislation to solve the problems or maybe in some way we could work with them? And what, are your, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think that that would be that, that would be kind of the hope, um, because the you know most of the most of the interest in antitrust um, is in trying to break these companies apart, and the the idea behind something like interoperability is that it doesn't actually take away anything from Facebook. 
it opens the door to, or from any 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 of these large tech companies, it, it opens the door for competitors to actually um, to be able to compete on a level playing field without having to build up the same sorts of large networks or bases of users that these other companies have already built up. Um, it allows it, it allows for customers who are on one big social network to decide that they want to switch without having to necessarily give up all of the resources um, and investment that they put into their existing system. Um, that's you know that that's the idea behind interoperability that it opens up competition without actually having to break down what's already there. Right. Um, makes those resources more available um, such that they can't they, they don't stymie competition. Now, there's no reason that everything has to be opened up, but there's no reason that everything should be opened up. It really is a matter of kind of identifying what are the key assets that prevent competitors from, uh, from coming up, coming up with new innovative products that you know, might, might do well in the market if only they could have that same sort of user base that isn't willing to switch right now. Right. Um, ultimately is what, that, that, that's going to be a difficult question, figuring out what are those aspects that, uh, where, where there, should be, there should be more openness and more, more data interchange. Um, but ultimately, I think that if those sorts of things can be worked out, if we can figure out kind of what are the, what are the main pressure points, uh, what are the most effective aspects to, to open up um, to, to encourage competition, then interoperability ends up working very well as a way of avoiding having to, um, having to use antitrust as the way of increasing competition. Awesome. Well said. Well, thank you very much for your time, Charles. Um, we'll talk again soon. And uh, um, this was a, a great intro to this topic, hopefully for many. And um, next couple of times we talk about this, we'll, we'll touch on some other examples. I touched on Apple. We could talk about Tesla and Tesla Roadsters. There's lots of interesting examples in how um, uh, ensuring interoperability as a, uh, as a practice um, would be uh, benefit us all as consumers and users. Yeah, it's, it's such a fascinating and broad topic. And you know, I, one, one of the reasons that I find the, the work we're doing on this really interesting is that a lot of people wanna see this as just you know, here is a possible mandate that can increase competition. And it's so much more. Um, and it's so much more interesting because of that. So, you know, I think it's a, that interoperability is just such a great topic to talk about. And I'm glad that, that people are interested in learning about it. Awesome. Well, I'll talk to you again soon. This has been Lincoln Shorts.